I would invite you um, to, in case you want to be reminded of the scripture passage that um, I'm about to speak of again, um, you can make that note on your notes on the, the back of your bulletin. And I would like you to be thinking and praying over this week. Um, John 13, 12b, do you know what I've done for you? And then uh, John 13, 17, since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. <laughs> do you know what I have done for you? How many times in our lives have we said those words? either aloud um, to one of our children or um, friends or relatives, or maybe silently. Often when we ask that question, do you know what I have done for you, um, we're kind of not expecting the person to say, sure I do. We're kind of expecting that they have not paid attention to those things that we are doing for them, those things that we are extending, the ways we are extending ourselves for them to help them, to care for them. And so it was with Jesus um, on the night that he was to be betrayed. He was um, having a meal with his friends, and in this passage, he has just washed their feet. And he says, do you know what I have done for you? Because obviously they have not paid attention in the way that he would hope they would pay attention um, this is that night in which he has so much to share with them, that last night, that last opportunity that he can remind them once again of the way he is inviting them to be in ministry to all people everywhere, to touch all the lives of all those that have been touched already, but then to touch the lives of those who he has not yet had the opportunity to touch. And, and Jesus wants them to remember the kind of people that he is calling them to be. And so he says, do you know what I have done for you? Because what he did was on his last night on earth, in the Gospel of John, we are told what he did is he got down on his hands and feet and he washed their feet. The same feet that had been walking all day long in the dust of, of um, Jerusalem, and, and the same feet that were probably hard and calloused and stinky, he was down there washing their feet. And he wanted them to pay attention to why. Why was this so important? What was he trying to teach them when he was doing this very menial task? Because we know that this was not the task of someone in a position of authority or someone who they would call teacher or rabbi, someone that they would revere for having power and influence over their lives. This is not what people in power or authority did. This was what the lowliest of the servants did. And we note that there were no servants there in the upper room that night. You know, was that a mistake? Maybe. People like to speculate, you know, how come the disciples didn't come in and, and wash their, the, each other's feet? And, you know, maybe they didn't want to because they were dirty and stinky. But, but really what's important is not so much why it didn't happen. It's that it was an opportunity for Jesus to teach one more time in a powerful way that they would be able to carry that memory with them for the rest of their lives. Because for the rest of their lives, they would remember on the other side of what was about to happen the next day, they would remember what had happened that night, just hours before he was betrayed, just 24 hours before he was going to die. He was on his knees, washing their feet, showing them the kind of leader that they were going to be called to be. Because Already, he had been asked, we, we know in the Gospel of Luke, we're told that two of them, the brothers James and John, had asked, can, you know, can we sit on either side of you? Well, what a great honor to sit on either side of the person who ate with outcasts, who cured the lepers, who was pretty much um, demonized by the people of his own religious um, hierarchy. They wanted to sit on either side of him because they had this idea this belief of what was going to happen and what was supposed to happen in their minds was that a leader like David would come. That was the Messiah that they were all looking for. And there was nothing in their three years together that would indicate in any way, shape, or form that that was the direction that he was leading. And yet they were still hoping 
Because just four days before that night, they had had that moment they'd been waiting for. You know, people are waving palms and people are shouting, Hosanna, save us, save us. And people are all excited that he had entered into Jerusalem. That was what they were looking for. That's what they'd been waiting for. The, the, the time that they were going to come into Jerusalem and, and their people, their followers, um, the followers of Jesus were going to kind of start taking control over the temple and, and, and then God would do what God had said God would do. God would save God's people. And Jesus said, but look what I've done. Look at me. <laughs> I was just down on my hands and, and knees so that you would have your feet washed by me. Because if you want to be great, if you want to be a leader, you need to be a servant to all. Because this is the kind of leadership that you're going to have to be doing into the future. This is what's going to change the lives of people. This is how people are going to know that you are my followers, that you are my disciples. Because you are going to humble yourself. And you are going to show the love that God has shown to me and to you, to others. And that's the kind of leaders that you're going to need to be. And he knew, he knew that night that he had a big task ahead of him because he was getting them ready. He was getting ready himself for what was lying before him the next day, but he was getting them ready for what would come to pass over the next day and the days to follow and the weeks and the months and years that would come after that because their lives were not going to be easy. There were going to be questions. They were going to be afraid. They were going to be persecuted. And they needed to be ready. They needed to be the kind of leaders that Jesus had actively engaged in, in ministry with them to show them how to be. How to be humble, how to be a servant, how to love people regardless, how to forgive sins, how to be merciful, how to be just, how to listen to the, the cries of the people that were surrounding them and not ignore them because they were the lowliest of the low. He was teaching them exactly what he needed them to know. And even in that hour, they could hardly hear what he was saying because... They thought it was supposed to go a different way. And so that's why he says in verse 17... Since you know these things, that servants are in greater than their master, nor are those who sent them, since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. You know, the whole world has a different impression of happiness. You know, the whole world, then and now, thinks that you're going to be happy when people serve you, when people take care of you, people give you things, people make sure you have everything you need. The whole world isn't thinking that the way I'm going to be most happy is when I'm serving others. But this is the life to which we have been called. Because when Jesus was saying it to them, it was so that it could be handed down to us, so that we might hear the good news that God was trying to impart, that there is something special for us to do, and that God has called us to a special mission, a special purpose, and that purpose is to love and care for the people of God's world and God's creation, to make sure that everybody comes to know the love of Christ, and, and to know that God has a, a purpose for their lives as well, and, and they won't be able to feel that unless they have that opportunity to experience God's love through us. So people of Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church, who is God calling us to serve? What kind of faith community is God calling us to become? Because we know over the past 33 years, the good work we've done, we have incredible ministries to children, both on Sunday and during the weeknights, but also during the weekdays. Um, and, 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 and the fact that we are home to Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and, and the fact that, that our youth are, are finding ways to now go out into mission on their own and, and that we serve literally God's people from when they are first born until they enter into life eternal as, as we continue to be supportive of the Aldersgate community. We know that God has already laid so much work on our hearts, but we also know that the community in which we live is ever-changing. 
and that whatever God has called us to do in the past, we may continue doing, but we also may be called to new opportunities to serve. Not just those immediately around us, and not just those in the surrounding area of Topeka, but, but into our state and into our country and into the rest of God's world. Because God has us to be servants, to teach others about God's love. And what God is asking us to do is to not give up on this great opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ each and every day. Because each and every day, we have the opportunity to wake up and encounter someone we may never have met before. And each and every day, we have the opportunity to be praying for people who so need our prayers. And each and every day, we have the opportunity to serve in new ways. Because sometimes that thing we've been doing doesn't bring us that happy anymore, that, that feeling of blessing and joy. And, and, and we've kind of, kind of lost our enthusiasm for the work that we thought we were called for. And that might be because God is urging you to do a new work. God is urging you to entertain a new ministry opportunity. God is urging you to serve exactly where you are in new ways. But, but for us... The question is always, what is God calling us to do? Who is God calling us to serve? And how are we becoming those people, that faith community that God is forming, ever forming us to be? Our invitation, our challenge, our gift, is that in all the ways that God has given us those talents and those spiritual gifts and those abilities, we are given opportunities to share those with others. And so if, if you're ever wondering what is your purpose, I invite you to go to prayer. And if you're ever wondering if, if you're going to be able to hear it clearly, I invite you to invite me to be praying with you or any member of, of our staff or of the teams in which you participate. But most importantly... Our challenge is for this week ahead to do an act of service, an intentional act of service to demonstrate God's love to someone who needs to feel it. To do an intentional act of service to someone who needs to feel God's love. You may not know this minute, even tomorrow morning, what that will be, but I promise you, if you are praying for God to open up that opportunity for you, you will find that opportunity. God will make it clear. You'll feel that little nudge, and you'll think, oh, I don't know if that's something I can do or I want to do. And you know, I can almost assure you that that might be exactly what God's calling you to do. But um, when you feel the nudge, pray. Ask God, am I hearing clearly? But also, if you're out there somewhere, and you see something that you could do for someone, be intentional about offering yourself in that way. And sometimes that means literally holding that door open as long as it takes with a smile on your face to show someone that they are important enough for you to wait for them to come in that door. And sometimes it means taking the time to listen through a whole conversation, not just the part that's of interest to you but the whole conversation so that someone might bear their heart to you so that they might feel the love that you have for them. I just invite you to open yourself to serve someone this week so that God's love might be felt through you. May all the glory be to God and may we always remember that we serve a God who first served us, who was willing to do whatever it took to show that God's intention is for us to be in relationship with him and to live into a life eternal, a life of abundance and joy. Amen.